you had a post a couple of weeks ago, or yeah. actually it was like two days ago, um, yeah. that talked about your predictions for 2020. Mm. Um, and one of them was companies being over reliant on outbound. Yes. Um, and I share that belief as well, but I thought it would be helpful to kind of like go way deeper on like why that's happening and why you think that. Yeah. Um, so like from my past experience, I ran marketing for a company called Sales Hacker. And we would work with a lot of B2B tech companies that would come to us for community, brand, webinars, right? We were a community that helped those companies do those things. And the reason why they would come to us is because they couldn't do it on their own. So when I asked like, okay, so what are you guys doing for lead gen? Like, what are you guys doing for brand? Like basically just straight up outbound. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're a cold calling machine. You're an outbound sales machine. You know, how is this, how is this working? Mm -hmm. And basically they would say, well, there's a reason why we're coming to you at this point. Because like, yeah, maybe their founder has like a connection to some other company and they have integration. So there's like this idea of like product led growth now. So you, I think you can couple product led growth with outbound and get to a certain point, but you will eventually, you know, start to struggle. Yeah. So that's why those companies would come to us and say, how can we get involved in the community? How can we leverage your marketing firepower to get our brand out there? Because we're, we're starting to lose because we're not known. Mm -hmm. And so at what, at what point do you think that we run into trouble? Is it like 5 million, 10 million? Yeah, I think it's maybe 3 million. Okay. I think you can, <clears throat> I think you can outbound your way product and outbound your way. And maybe even with some degree of like affiliate support, get to three million ARR, mm -hmm. maybe three to five. But then once you hit that, you might plateau. And what is the, what is when you say trouble? What does that mean? Like, yeah, what it's a KPI? Is it a feeling? Like, what is it? Yeah, it's just you know you're not able to uh, acquire and retain customers uh, at at a rate that's allowing you to to basically grow. Yeah, because so the growth curve, while the growth is linear on a yeah. growth path, it actually has to be exponential, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so, because what hap your customer acquisition cost remains the same or goes up as you have to hit that exponential curve, and so how do you keep them down? Uh, that, you do exactly marketing. Right. Exactly right. Right. Yeah, exactly right. And so, so yeah. Go ahead. I, I mean, I was just gonna say, like, I just think they. It also has a lot to do with like the kinds of companies that, that do that. You know, it's, it's, it tends to be founders that don't really have marketing expertise. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be a core founding group of founders. Maybe it's like, you know, two co-founders that are, you know, sales and product led. They, they don't have the expertise in marketing. So they just kind of don't, they, they maybe believe in it, but they don't prioritize it. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, find someone, hire someone who can do that. Mm -hmm. So that's just maybe why it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so I've worked in a couple of those companies before, yeah. 100 sales reps, three marketer, three comms, or 12 sales reps, one marketer. Um, what yeah. do you think the, what do you think the balance is for like a, a company in terms of whether it's budget or headcount, um, a ratio between sales and marketing? Like where should companies aspire to be? Yeah, that's a really, I mean, I think it depends on your sales cycles, the ACV, mm -hmm. like all sorts of things. But I can tell you, like, when I was at Pipedrive, um, we had about uh, maybe 30 inside sales reps and the marketing team was maybe five. Mm -hmm. So maybe f five to 30. And like, we were able to kind of, you know, like every person in marketing had like a huge responsibility. So like, I was in charge of like most of the inbound organic SEO. Mm -hmm. We had someone doing paid acquisition. We had um, a marketing director kind of just pulling all the strings and stuff and like kind of just guiding the strategy, if you will. Um, we had somebody doing like affiliate marketing. Uh, that was a big part of the, of this, of the strategy as well. Um, and then we had like a marketing automation email marketer slash like customer marketer. And then, you know, a bunch of outsources. So like writing and, this, and a product marketer mm -hmm. as well. So <clears throat> it was like everybody had these like core pillars. And then, you know, I think we had enough enough of, of productivity and, and output to support sales at that point to where, you know, they could throw more sales bodies and then we would start to say, okay, now we're not able to, to feed the sales engine enough. We may need to think about adding another component. So mm -hmm. it's kind of whatever that lead flow has to be maintaining enough, you know, marketing support to, to fill 
the 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 mouths yeah. of, of the reps. That yeah, you and so, so I work with a lot of companies that are yeah. close to ten to one sales okay. to marketing. Yeah, and I think that the target for a company should be somewhere between two to one and four to one. Okay, somewhere yeah. in that range. Like yeah. you still, from a budget and a headcount standpoint, That's have right. more salespeople. But as you grow over time, I believe that the marketing engine, especially in the, in the coming years, the marketing engine will become more important than the sales engine. I, yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Yeah. So we're aligned on that. So, yeah. so let's talk about why we think that's important, right? So yeah. if I can, I'll elaborate a little bit. So the way that I look at it is fundamentally, and everyone says this and it's super clear to you and I, but like the way people buy stuff is, has changed. It's not changing, it has changed, right? They have way more control and then it's where are they paying attention? Yeah. And so the ways that reps are going to communicate are places where people aren't paying attention anymore. Yeah. Cold yeah. calls, cold emails, LinkedIn DMs, like people can feel it, understand it and put and push back, right? Yeah. And so how do you get people in places where they are paying attention. And so one thing that I've noticed is if you look at the best, some of the best sales people are actually doing marketing now. Yeah. Which leads me to another hypothesis, which is that I think that companies that were really thoughtful and had the right people could move to a full funnel account executive model where the account executive is actually doing their prospecting. They're just not, they're just not doing the prospecting in the way they do it right now. Exactly, yeah. And we're seeing a lot of, I think, that now um, because you know, how do you, I think in the example from Josh Braun yesterday, you know, if you have, oh, I, f I forgot what he said. If, would you rather buy from Dr. Oz or Dr. Bob? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and like, that's a very extreme example, right? But like, you would rather do business with someone that you know. Mm -hmm. And that's, and going back to that sales hacker example, like, that's why, uh, you know, those companies that said, hey, we're doing a lot of outbound. Well, we're just getting ignored because no one's ever heard of us before. Mm -hmm. So actually that kind of feeds into one of the other things I was saying about the predictions, how like if you're using SDRs to do, if, you're, if your SDRs are doing uh, you know, marketing, that you're gonna be in, in, in a hard place. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be really hard for, like that's just reality that if you know, the SDR is making contact with a prospect that has never heard of you before, that's really a marketing email. Yeah. But it's gonna be hard to, somehow turn that into a sales conversation if they haven't heard from you. Cause like at any, at any given day, no buyer is really wakes up and says, I really need to think about a chat bot today, mm -hmm. or I need to think about a marketing automation solution today. Mm -hmm. Like the way I buy is once that problem is, is so painful that I can no longer ignore it. Then I go and search out for a solution. Mm -hmm. but or what, more yeah. importantly, you already know what solution. Right, yeah. And that's called brand. And that's yeah. what I think a lot of companies right now are missing yeah. is that you want to be just top of mind when someone's making a decision. You don't want to jam it down their throat when they don't want to buy it. Exactly right. Right. Yeah, exactly right. And so what's, what's, cause it's this easy segue into SDR metrics. So yeah. like I talk about this a lot and you know, I'm still ideating about what the, what I would recommend as a solution. So, mm -hmm. um, right now, most companies have SDRs that are comped or measured solely on the the meeting the booking no, the actual booking of a meeting yeah. sometimes if they no show they still get they still yeah. get credit for it yeah. and so um that i think is a broken model for a lot of reasons like yeah. for you and i marketers are now measured on revenue yeah and marketers are filling the top of the funnel very similar to what an sdr would do but the sdr is not accountable to revenue because yeah. they don't have control over it but neither does a marketer exactly right? right and so what what would what should companies think about to rechange how they measure an SDR function, yeah. or what should they change about what that? Maybe it goes into this uh, same question. What should they think about changing what the, that function does? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So at PipeDrive, there's this philosophy called activity-based selling, to where if you did a certain number of activities, uh, that would be considered like sort of the leading indicator that the lagging indicators would follow because you're doing the right behaviors that actually get you to, to get the at-bats. You need a certain amount of activities that are gonna earn you the at-bats to give you the, the opportunities, mm -hmm. essentially. And that worked for Pipedrive. They, they thought about like, how do we just focus on behaviors rather than you know, X amount of bookings or mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, but I'll tell you at, at Nextiva, the company I'm at now, we look at um, pipeline. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So that's a shared, that's actually the marketing and sales shared metric. Mm-hmm. And the SDRs are part of marketing at Nextiva. Interesting. Yeah. So what we're measured on not is not just necessarily MQLs or just, you know, we're casting a huge wide net at the top and just roping in a bunch of shrimp. Um, it's what percentage of that shrimp gets a contract presented to them. Mm-hmm. And I think it works for us because our sales cycles tend to be shorter. So we can kind of get away with it because it's a little bit more transactional, but it does make sense. You know, our, our mentality is that if the leads are reasonably interested and we're getting them from the right traffic sources like SEO, are we targeting the right keywords? AdWords, are we targeting the right terms? Affiliates, are we getting that referral traffic from int- buying intent terms? Um, there should be a reasonable degree of certainty around, yes, a percentage of this uh, will result in a, a, basically a contract, which we call a quoted amount. Mm-hmm. So we're measured on the daily and monthly quoted amount. How much of that traffic turned into a, a top of funnel lead and then how many of those became uh, presented with a, a, a value. Sure. And then based on historical performance, you know, if that is there, you win X percent and that's how you get there. And that's how we get there. Have you ever seen as you try and scale the pipeline that the win rate declines? Yes. And therefore, because you obviously have to go into different <laughs> traffic sources and it starts to get messy. And so yes, it's that is the, the one kind of challenge with measuring on pipeline. Yeah. And quoted amount is that as you try and grow, you actually don't act, get the same result that you want. And yeah. so what what does revenue play in that type of equation? Like, obviously, yeah. you're looking at it like it's your job. Totally. Um, so how I, I, we've told, toyed around with the idea of like a percentage of compensation for SDRs happening on um, revenue and the other half happening on whatever the other pieces are. Does that something yeah. that plays or do you think there's like flaws in that methodology? I, th- I think that can work. I think, um, it, you know, it could, it, it, it's tough because you could have, it, what happens for us a lot is we have a whale deal. Like we have one whale deal that can totally skew everything. And that happens like all the time, mm-hmm. you know, some huge deal will come in and we'll close it. But like the majority of them tend to be smaller. Um, and that could throw off, I think the, you know, the compensation based model where you Mm. get a cut of the revenue. But I ultimately, I do think that that is something companies should consider. We, we haven't gotten that far yet. Um, and to your point about like, you know, uh, pipeline, not necessarily being the best metric sometimes, cause look, this is what we're facing now. Top of funnel organic traffic is exploding. Like we're really good at getting that. And we're the way we're fighting back against other companies that have deeper pockets that are spending on airport ads and New York City subway banners and sports team marketing. Like we don't have those kinds of deep pockets like our competitors do. Mm -hmm. So the way we fight back against that is top of funnel content marketing. And that serves as like kind of the best, one of the best and most uh, inexpensive Mm -hmm. uh, ways to to get the brand out there. But as a result, uh, they're looking at, you know, traffic to conversion rates, which it appears that conversion rates are now going down because we have all this top funnel traffic. Mm -hmm. And what I'm just like kind of just explaining to leadership is like, well, this is just a natural thing. But if we just keep looking at do bookings continue to go up, Mm -hmm. regardless of conversion rates, then we'll be fine. Because what you're seeing is just a lot of top heaviness in the traffic distribution now. So that's that's kind of what we're we're dealing with. And how about so the airport ads and putting your uh, brand on a trash can or on a sports jersey, like where does that, where does that sit in your mind in terms of priorities in B2B? I think to frame it up a little bit, I think that there are channels that are just not worth the cost for the output, regardless of whether or not it's measurable, right? And so like uh, the things that you talked about most often are just blindly do it and know that that's part of your expense for brand Um, and my, feeling lately has been that brand is created based on more than just showing your logo yeah. and having someone see it. You have an awareness element, but there's actually, I think, a, a connection point that needs to happen more so than just that, the show. And this is different yeah. from B2C because B2C purchases are happening like very quickly in most yeah. cases, but in B2B, especially like high, higher ticket items, higher ACVs, um, I think that you need to get someone to have 
mo- you need to have more relevance to that person. Yeah, I, I would agree. And <clears throat> you know, one we haven't invested in that kind of advertising yet. I mean, we're entertaining some ideas right now, but that's because we have the growth engine working. Mm-hmm. So I feel like these kinds of things are the things you layer on top. But um, we have ways that we're thinking about measuring some of this stuff too. Like, let's say we do geographical targeting. Like, let's say we do like, you know, ads at the San Francisco airport, right? Mm-hmm. Then what we'll also do, well, what we'll plan to do if we go, if we do that, would be um, running uh, digital ads in San Francisco that kind of align with that message mm-hmm. to see if we're, if we're getting more kind of bites on those kinds of ads in San Francisco Mm -hmm. among that audience that we want to reach because it kind of would make sense. Like they're probably traveling a lot. Mm -hmm. They're seeing us. So they should be more likely to click on us. Um, The other thing we do is measure branded uh, search traffic Mm -hmm. and search. Love that metric. Search branded search volume. Like your brand search trend should be going like that. Mm -hmm. If these, you know, big brand radio podcast Mm -hmm. banner ads on billboards like if you're doing all that then in theory more people should be searching for your brand Mm -hmm. and you should at least see some spikes if you're going like real heavy Mm -hmm. like if you do a super bowl commercial your january brand traffic should go like that should and so and so i think leadership yeah gets caught up in the fact that you don't know which of those things is actually driving the branded search traffic yeah but I, as a marketer, know. You can just intuitively feel out of the things what is actually driving, especially if you have, I I make this example a lot and I haven't actually said it on like a a video before, but when when you control or you have oversight over all the different sources and you can pull levers, Mm -hmm. you know what's driving it. Totally. Everything remains the same, spend 10X more on Facebook, you see search traffic come through, inbound conversions go up, like, yeah. you know what's driving different things. Yeah. Um, I think that's super powerful. And some companies have such divided resources, especially as you get bigger, yeah. that the responsibility is only on the channel, not actually on the outcome. Right. Totally. totally. <laughs> I, speaking of Facebook, have you seen a decline in not just organic reach, but paid acquisition? Have you seen it getting more difficult, more cluttered? higher cost per acquisition on Facebook? Have you seen this trend? So there's a couple things that we're seeing, especially yeah. in the past six months. Yeah. Organic reach on Facebook got crushed it, three it, years it, ago. Yeah. Three Definitely. years ago, yeah. yeah. 10,000 followers, you're getting you're 20 getting, views yeah. on a post. Like it was, yeah. you were, it was you're, equivalent. You're posting down. organic was going yeah. out in the woods and screaming and hoping someone heard you. It was just completely useless to post yeah. organic on Facebook, yeah. except to have something on your page if yeah. someone happened to visit yeah. it. On the page- Do you still feel companies though should maintain some degree of like, activity on their organic brand pages just to show that you're not a ghost yeah so here's what we do actually so we (laughs) we run paid to distribute content on facebook yeah if we're running a campaign we'll run somewhere between 9 and 27 different ad variations Mm -hmm. the best performing ad variation you can take all the engagement off of that one and you can move it and schedule it to a post yeah and so whenever we run paid we're basically just testing which one's going to work the best and then we just move it over because we already we were going to do it anyway yeah so that's one way to do it on the paid side especially over the past six months depending on your audience yeah and that's a big one because we have some audiences where facebook is by far our best performing channel Mm -hmm. um and with cpms it still remains somewhere between four and six dollars okay but in other channel and other audiences we're paying 12 to 25 dollars cpms with less effective results and for those ones, the, the thing to try and understand is like, have these people left or are they more, as, as the feed happens, you start getting more tuned into how the ads are presented yeah. and you actually start to tune them out. It's kind yeah. of like a banner ad on a blog. Yeah, it's a numbing. Yep. And so people yeah. start to get like, oh, that's an ad I'm going to pass on it. Totally. Um, and I think some people have also moved, especially like in, in some industries that you or some buyers that you sell to, like yeah. those people are not there anymore. Yeah, they bounce around and they. Yeah. they just, so, yeah. I mean, we and Instagram ads have never performed as well for us yeah. as Facebook feed ads. If we're talking about the feed, we're yeah. testing a lot of story ads because we're testing story ads swipe ups and we're getting oh, like yeah. two two and a half to three dollars cpms okay nowhere near the click through rates you'd see in the feed but the yeah. cpms are so low yeah. and you get the brand awareness yeah. so we're testing those i don't have a clear so, sense so do you on think them. you think it's valuable for like the story ads to just be like a branding component like just as there's 
you know, they're swiping through stories. Oh, there it is. Okay, bye. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I think the impression the yeah. impression would be equivalent to putting your thing on a trash <laughs> on can, a trash your logo, can, yeah. or on something or like else. A blue pen. Yeah, because yeah. you're going to get the one second impression before someone clears it, and you yeah. get the one percent swipe up. Maybe yeah. the same thing. I think about YouTube pre roll. Yeah. So like YouTube pre roll, I consider ninety percent brand. Yeah. Ten percent totally, performance. Totally. And totally. so people measure it like AdWords. Yeah, yeah but there's and it's not AdWords. It's not AdWords, but there's companies murdering it in yeah. YouTube 15 to se second, you know, pre roll ads yeah. like, you know, Wistia and Grammarly. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, excuss me, Wix and Grammarly. Yeah, yeah. Robinhood's been Robin showing Hood, up a lot. Uh, Monday.com. Yeah. yeah. Mo uh, Monday's Mon just digital, uh, digital uh, execution yeah. is great. Their product's not that great, but. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But that just goes to show you, you know, like some companies are really good at marketing a turd. So, you know, if you are one of these, I think we talked about this before, but like a copycat company mm -hmm. where you just, you know, there's a million project management tools out there. Yeah, let's create a project management tool that's like pretty similar to Asana and mm -hmm. all these other ones. And we'll just like outmarket them. Yeah. We'll just raise money and just like we'll outmarket you. Yeah. And that would, me personally, that would, I would feel horrible if I got outmarketed. Yeah. Like I would feel like a failure. I think that uh, it's tough to, there is a copycat thing, but I actually don't view it that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you think about like a lot of the products that have been built or happened, like they, there was somebody before them that was doing it. Magic Taxi versus Uber. Yeah. Uber started two years later and just crushed them, which just, yeah. it all comes down to execution, yeah. right? Whether it's on the product side, the marketing side, the sales side, the strategy is great, but it's mostly execution. Yeah. And so um, same thing with like what Instagram stories did with Snapchat, like tried to buy Snapchat, yeah. they were like, no, thank you. Like, oh, all right, we're all gonna throw we'll it down just, then. Yeah, yeah. we'll just make our own. And uh, completely it. crushed their user yeah. growth. And yeah. so um, I, I don't feel such a negative thing about copying. I think it's just the, the fact that you're taking someone's feature and integrating it into your product after they've done all the, it's like a yeah. fast follower type of yeah. uh, methodology that's been around forever. Yeah. Um, and then it just comes down to like, are you better at communication? It, that's, that's what we're yeah, here to yeah, talk yeah, about. That's exactly right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, let's get into a couple of those other things because we, um, we've we been talking, I've been talking and so have you and I think this is interesting to go like really, really deep for people on the state of the trade show booth. Oh man, yes. So, um, so I got to this point of view, not by like theoretical, like I worked at companies where their main strategy was to go to trade shows. Yeah. And co uh, company after company go there, have no results. Go there, have no results. To one point, like we had digital working and we were spending a half a million dollars on trade shows and sponsorships. And I measured uh, a trade show based on leads for a six month window. And we collected a hundred badges and closed zero, actually created zero opportunities and zero deals. I know that some people are going to say, oh, well, you didn't follow up well enough or you didn't do this. <laughs> yeah, you didn't have a sales process. We spent, we spent $50,000 on a trade show. We didn't close any deals. And I know for fact, because it was working, that we can get four to six X the results for pennies on the dollar running Facebook ads to the same exact people. Yeah. And so this is not about the trade show doesn't work. It's that there are better ways to do it. It's just there are more effective ways to do it, I think. Yeah. And I think we should go so people really understand, like break it down about why, um, like why you think that they've become ineffective. Yeah. So I can I can tell you, regretfully, that you know my company Nextiva, kind of falls into that guilty trap. There, mm -hmm. you know, there have been events that we've dumped a lot of money into, and came out with no return, and. Um, there, there, there's a few reasons why I feel that that's the case, but some of the more common reasons why I think companies get into the trap of this is outside pressure. So for example, uh, I won't name the, the conference that this happened at, but one of our, like there's, there's one conference in our industry that happens every year where there's no buyers. It's just companies um, basically trying to show off to analysts. Mm -hmm. So they're, so they're spending, oh man, mega hundreds of thousands on, you name it, the entrance banners, uh, the, the biggest and baddest booths, yeah. merch, uh, huge teams of people there, big demo uh, you know, uh, exhibition, right? 
you, t-shirts, uh, sponsoring the happy hour, like the whole shebang. Yeah. And there's no buyers there. Yeah. It's just to show analysts that they're the biggest and quote baddest yeah. around. So then what will happen is the Gartner analysts will you know, go back and write, oh, this company is really looking promising. Yeah. Yeah. And then that will um, also, in, uh, I guess you could say increase investor shareholder confidence when they see these analyst reports coming out you know recaps oh i was just at this event and you know xyz company had this new thing on display and and they were you know they were everywhere and they took us out to dinner and schmoozed us and boozed us so i think when you get to a certain degree of like you know uh of once your company reaches a certain height Mm -hmm. where now analysts matter these companies are willing and they have mm-hmm. the deep pockets. They're willing to blow this money mm-hmm. purely for perception. Yeah. So, so then when you have a company like mine that has to go up with that, the fear is if, well, what if we're not there? Mm-hmm. What are analysts going to think? Oh, they must not be doing well. Mm-hmm. They can't afford to be there. Mm-hmm. So now you're in this very hard and weird place where do I make an investment in this just for hype and perception even though i know there's no buyers there i can guarantee you there's no buyers there because i've been there and i've seen it or do i just say you know what i'm not going to follow i'm not going to follow the status quo Mm -hmm. i'm going to go where customers are where where it matters to have my brand in front of customers Mm -hmm. and not try to just be in a you know a a chest you know pushing pushing out my chest battle yeah so that's that's one thing that i think is a real challenge once your company reaches a certain Point. Same companies yeah. do it on, I'm at that trade show, and if I don't go, it's going to kill my brand. It's going to kill my and brand. Everyone's going to, all my customers are going to go to my competitor's booth and use their product, and it's like, <laughs> that's not what's going to happen. That's not what's going to happen. That's not what's going to happen. Not no. what's gonna happen. No. But, I mean, companies, they are play, they play a lot of defense at, yeah. at some level, even if they're yeah. small. Yes. Um, which is just interesting to think about. Mm-hmm. And so... So yes, people do it for that reason. They yeah. they attribute it. Oh, we're not measuring it on on leads. We're going to measure it on brand instead. Not still not recognizing the same exact thing, which is that yeah. you can create better brand for far less expensive with better results in yes. different ways. Yes. Um, and so this is purely a game of what's the alternative. It, exactly right. Yeah. And my, and my alternative to that whole thing with the analysts is like, why not just fly the analyst out to your HQ? Show that analyst a great time. Take him, yeah. take him or her to the most expensive restaurant. Talk about the business. Maybe invite them to the office. Have them, you know, meet with the engineering team. Show them some new things that are on the dot. Like you can achieve that exact same mm-hmm. thing, you know, without all the madness. Mm-hmm. So it's I, I, what I think it boils down to is like companies just have to just say no. Mm-hmm. Like I refuse to become a victim to this absurd model. Yeah, because the prices of the booths yeah. have continued to. To, to soar. To soar. To soar. And the attendance has probably remained similar or, or growing. Or, yeah. But the attention on the booth has gone completely down. Completely. <laughs> and so the, the pricing of the of the booth was based on a time where if it was 1999, yeah. that was the only way for people to buy B2B products. Right. It was either a salesperson cold calls you because there is barely an internet. There's no B2B companies on the internet. And so the discovery is a salesperson calls you or you go to the industry trade show, which is probably the, actually the most popular, and you go and look at all of the new stuff. Right. Right? That world doesn't exist anymore. Right. It does. Yeah, exactly. People are waiting six months to launch a, a product yeah. at a trade show that doesn't matter anymore when they should just launch the product and they could do it way bigger and better online, yeah. whether it's through influencer marketing, paid ads, uh, PR, like there's a, a, a bunch of different ways to get it done. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we're in complete agreement there. Uh, the, the other trap that my company falls into is the channel partner road shows. Yeah. So this is a scenario where um, we have like a lot of regional and local presence in some areas. You know where I'm going. I know with exactly this. You know what exactly you're talking where I'm about. Going with this. Yeah. And you have to be at these local and regional areas because there's an ecosystem of partners and resellers that are in these areas and they expect you to be there at these at these road shows. And the booth price is what, like five five oh, K? It's not oh, a lot, right? Or no? It's it's anywhere between like like ten K is like high. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it seems, in the grand scheme of things, marginal. Marginal. But you're but doing a lot of them. You're, yeah. Exactly right. You're doing it in Dallas. You're doing it in San Diego. You're uh -huh. doing it in LA. You're doing, you know. And the people there are not there to discover. No. And, I've, and what, been, I've been the attendee at so many yeah. of those events. You get very small return on this. And what it ends up being is just like a drinking, you know, party mm -hmm. for the partners and, and, the, and the channel mm -hmm. managers. Um, now I'm not I'm not trying to downplay it totally. I do think that there there you know there is some value in doing them in some regional areas where you're trying to grow more of a customer base, mm -hmm. right? But uh, just for doing them for the sake of doing them, I I, I hate it. Yeah, you know? and so I, I there's a point that people push back on me that I really want to clarify because it's probably relevant to what you just said too. Is that you should do those things. You just shouldn't get the booth. Exactly. You, should, yeah. you should go to all of the trade shows where your buyers or your partners or you know the thought leaders or whoever yeah. you need to go to. You should be there, yeah. but you shouldn't have the booth and then you should use those monies. So the things that I'm thinking about are <laughs> the ways that you should go and have a strategy on, on a trade show is no booth. Yeah, and then, I agree. And no then booth. take that money dinners yes like specific targeted dinners with the right people totally in planet and advance. then yeah and then content creation yes. find all of the people set up a thing like yes. this get an airbnb or a penthouse or whatever yeah. however what it could you be outside do. of a coffee it could, shop. yeah it could yeah. be whatever production yeah. value you want to go to yeah. and create 10 whatever how many videos you want to do yeah. pro con debates round tables yeah. interviews yeah. you know discussions hot takes whatever totally um outside the booth do like little like more raw type stuff little sound bites and then yeah. and then what you do is you take the five thousand people that were at the event and you expand your reach dramatically because yeah. you've created 20 pieces of content that can be then broken down into hundreds more yeah. and amplified across the internet to all your buyers yeah. for less even with paid amplification yeah. online still through ads less. on top of it, still less, still than, the less booth. than the booth. Still less than the booth. I couldn't agree more. You know, the final thing I'll say is don't just think of events as cold acquisition or mm. cold prospect, um, you know, building, right? Pipeline building, pure cold. Uh, the most effective way I've, I've seen uh, events being utilized is pipeline acceleration. Mm -hmm. So deals you already have kind of pending or in motion or you know, conversations happening. This is where you accelerate those deals. Yeah. This is where close you, deals. Cl exactly. You yeah. close them too. Yeah. You get these people in a room at a dinner um, and you, you know, you invite maybe some key customers along with you to, you Love know, it. to, to just kind of, you know, bolster your position without you saying it. Mm -hmm. And then that's how you can, you can use these events as like kind of, you know, they, it's, it's a point that all, all this stuff comes together. And you know you use the event basically as an excuse mm -hmm. to make it all happen rather mm -hmm. than just cold pipeline. I have to meet people and build pipeline there. Yeah. Yeah. And so you were there last night, and we're start. I mean, we'll talk about this event. Um, I don't know if it's a hypothesis or like we're still trying to form exactly what it looks like. But um, instead of doing the big events with the big boost, do a lot of micro events. Chorus is doing yeah. something with Josh Braun right now, which yeah. has gotten a lot of. Um, really good response. Hundreds of people are already registered for those things across 12 different cities. Um, and I'm starting to do it as well, which is you go to a place, you either have a guest or you do your own, whatever it is, content. Um, you invite people, you host the event, you film the whole thing, and you do the thing that Chorus is doing that I disagree with is I think that you should be doing a different piece of content in every city because then you can amplify the content. Right. If you do the same content in 12 cities, you only get one piece of content to amplify. Yeah. And so different content in every city, film it, um, the things that you get. You do get um, some type of business development, even though you're not going for it. So yeah. one of the caveats is that none of these events are measured on leads or sales. It's measured on the effectiveness of the content, I would say qualitative engagement inside of the content, which then creates brand and future sales. And so the mindset needs to change about these events because if you're yeah. going in there, once the mindset is, okay, I need to get leads, it's going to transition to, okay, how do I get a speaker that's going to pitch my product? And then you completely yeah. destroy it because you just invited 20 people there and they didn't come here for a sales pitch. Yeah. And so yeah. you do get business development, but you get it in a different way. Yeah. You get content creation, you get brand awareness based on, you know, I spoke with Josh last night. Josh works with a lot of SaaS companies. He posted about the event we did last night. What does that create? Yeah. Um, Whoever you have as a guest is going to amplify the content to their audience, so then you get that. 
um, then you create the videos and you amplify them online. So yeah. there's like yeah. multi-pronged strategy. It would be yeah. basically how do you take a long form video strategy like what we're doing right now, but always have an audience yeah. and get all those other net benefits. Um, that's something that I feel it would be strong, but I actually believe this is that that is the best execution in B2B marketing today. I, I'm in agreement with you. Yeah. And, the, and you know, if my marketing ops leader was here, he'd, he would definitely try to, you know, tackle me through this window <laughs> with what I'm about to say. But he's very nuts and bolts, dollars in, dollars mm -hmm. out. You know, we're, everyone we're, is. Everyone is, right? We're dropping X thousands on this event. What is my return on this? You know, and they're just purely looking at pipeline and bookings. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you know, that's a short term way of looking at it. I, I do think that you could have a component of that, but it can't be the sole thing yeah. that you're that you're looking at. My issue with with the way of looking at that is that yeah. it creates the wrong behavior. It's, so yeah, it, it creates does. very short term behavior and it also restricts you into channels that you can measure. Yeah. And so it, it cuts out. I believe that most of the best executions can't be measured as long. Yeah. If you're doing it the right way, then it actually should be unmeasurable by definition. Because I think by trying to force the measurement, you actually do something that's inefficient or yeah. creates friction for a buyer. I, I agree. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, let's, <laughs> let's go deeper into that. So we had we were talking in the comments. And I think this one will be fun. Um, so performance marketing oh, yeah. and brand marketing. Yeah. Um, it's easy segue. So I, I would say, you know, from a from a mindset standpoint, I can't I can't imagine that ninety eight percent of people are purely in the performance marketing camp in B two B. Even if they don't recognize that they're in that camp, they're in that camp. They're in that camp um, because yeah. of the way they think about even the metrics they score and things like that and how they invest dollars. It's very clear everything's going for direct response sales type stuff. Totally. And so um, I posted something that I think is interesting mainly not because I think it's structurally correct but I think it forces a company to think about this differently um, is that you need to have separate teams with separate budgets with separate KPIs between yeah. um, what you would what some companies would call performance marketing or demand gen versus brand I, I agree and you know we're, we're getting to that point actually yeah uh, so it's interesting we have uh, a full-time brand marketer and we have video team. So the brand, the, our full-time brand marketing manager is part of demand gen, but we don't measure his stuff the way that we measure performance stuff, mm -hmm. right? So ultimately I'm on the hook for leads, for, for traffic, right? Um, and, and also like conversion rates on, on pages. Like I, I need to increase conversion rates mm -hmm. on key pages. That's one thing that I'm measured on. Um, we don't. We can never measure our brand marketer like that. No. Never, because it's just too difficult. He's mm -hmm. not. He's not even doing those activities. Mm -hmm. So, we have a video team. We have uh, a video producer that works only on brand. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, like for the the other stuff, we have another video producer that just does like customer testimonial videos, mm -hmm. um, product videos, right? Not. 15 second or 30 second YouTube uh, display ad videos mm -hmm. or pre-roll videos, right? Like, or even just top of funnel kind of just branding commercial ideas. Mm -hmm. Like we, we kind of are getting to a point now where we're separating church and state. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a better way to, to just do marketing because you just, not everyone's operating with this fear of, oh my gosh, it's not going to generate leads. Yeah. So if I do this ad campaign and it, you know, Maybe maybe email list captures is the KPI. Mm -hmm. That's a better one mm -hmm. rather than all right. What was the you know pipeline value generated from th this you know display retargeting campaign? Mm -hmm. Like it's tough. And so uh, I think people even struggle with it. and I have too. Up until like maybe six months ago, didn't recognize that there are actually is a clear difference. Yeah. And people, the definition I've been continuing to work on a way to make it simple. It's just like. The difference is whether or not you are looking for an immediate ROI and you're measuring to that. If you are not, and you know that by doing these different things, it will create awareness and then product sub, I, I look at it as awareness, sub -pro product, uh, subconscious product yeah. uh, consideration, and then inbound opportunities based on that. Yeah, subconscious so, product, I love that. I, I yeah. love that, right? Yeah. Because that's all you're doing. Yeah, that's like all you're doing. people see your yeah. stuff and then all they do is say, oh, that was good. And yeah. They, and then they click on the logo 
and they read the profile. And if your profile is done well, they read it. Oh, if it resonates with them, click on the website, consume the value proposition. And if it actually is direct response, that's the flow, the flow that it would go to, but you're not asking for it. Yeah. Yeah. Or 20 pieces of content later, and then they recognize the issue inside of their business and they search your brand in Google and they go through like that. Exactly. And so I think people, uh, marketers a lot, are forced to put a call to action in everything. Yeah. And so it happens in LinkedIn posts. And I think we could, we'd definitely uh, get into LinkedIn too. Um, is that, you know, the person, the whoever, whatever they do, whoever. I'm not going to say it, they, they write a post with a thousand characters of value, but then the bottom three sentences are, we help companies just like you. If you want, you can text me. Here's my number. And the thing is that you need to either be giving or, or asking or taking. And you, if you do it in the same thing, you're not giving anything. It's not truly giving value. It's yet. not content yeah. marketing. No, it's a thinly veiled attempt yes. at content marketing, but it's really an ad. And it actually, like, the, it feels worse than just saying, hey, you know, I do this stuff. I think I could help you. You could text me. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, there's no sense in writing the stuff before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, why try to mask it? Like, just, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. It's just, a, uh, I, I, I've found over time that no matter what the tactics or anything, it's actually the mindset that drives everything yeah. in marketing. Yeah. 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 I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really thankful that we have leaders that just, get it mm -hmm. you know like i don't have to explain why we need to do top of funnel seo yeah i don't have to explain why we need to do grammarly monday.com style youtube advertising mm -hmm. i don't have to explain why not everything has to have pipeline and roi you know like you said some of the best executions are not necessarily the most measurable mm -hmm. and you know it's like it's like the impact of me talking about my top 10 predictions on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. you know, purists will tell you, well, you're not talking about your brand. You're not talking about your product. You're not talking about features. Uh, how is this beneficial to the brand? It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with the brand. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, how it benefits because I have, I maintain a signal to noise ratio. And for every, you know, four or five things I put out that are not about the brand, mm -hmm. I'll sneak one in there. Mm -hmm. And one of those things I happen to sneak in there once in a while is, Hey, we're hiring. Yeah for these roles. Maybe it's sales roles, maybe it's marketing roles, maybe it's customer success, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. And I'm gonna get 10, 11, 12 DMs. You mm -hmm. better believe it. And what the message says to everyone that's not ready to hire is, hey, we're growing. It, ex exactly. There's a, there's there, a there's message that. in there that, <laughs> yeah. that's, again, like without saying so directly or anything, you're just leaving a message. But yeah. in order for anyone to get that message, they have to follow you. In order for them to follow you and actually listen to they what you have to say, yeah. you have to give them stuff that they want. That's the and so I ask thing. it all the time yeah. because people um, will post things and, and say stuff like, um, like the, you could easily measure the success of this LinkedIn post. All you need to do is just post a link and then you know, ask people to click on it and they would convert. And I'm just like, well, the reason that my content works is because I don't do that. <laughs> exactly. It's because I'm not asking for anything. And what yeah. happens like the 30th time the CMO watches my video and that one works for them and it's everything hits, they send me a direct message and then they are talking to me. They're driving the conversation, not me driving it with them. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the beauty of it. You, I think you guys even said it Yes, I think you said it yesterday at the event with uh, Josh Braun. You said, uh, you know, I don't even have to sell. Like, I, I put out the content. Um, I provide enough value. They'll eventually search me and what I do. They'll see that we have a, an offer that fits their, you know, their need mm -hmm. at that moment. And they'll come knocking at the door. Mm -hmm. And I believe in that. And I, I, I believe over the next, I, I don't want to say years, but it's probably in the, within the decade that there will be companies that have, have a, a mediocre product, like a good, a good enough yeah. product. Like a basic CRM. A, a basic product yeah. that are really good at marketing yeah. where companies come and hand them money. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because you've created so much brand up front and some products just don't need all of the extra firepower. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I mean, and then the, the opposite of that is also doubly true, where if you don't invest in brand, 
you you will crumble. Yeah. Because there, we're you know we're approaching a world of sameness now. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some <clears throat> there was some wild stat. <clears throat> I think it was on uh, Chief Martech Scott Brinker's website that like eighty percent of like marketing automation tools get changed every year. Marketers mm -hmm. change like their tools like. Mm -hmm. That like every like seventy percent or something like that change like their tools yeah. like every year. So how do, like if you're let's just say that you know it you are in a in a you know world where people change products a lot. Like my my world business phone service, you know they will change their phone system because someone raised prices on them mm -hmm. or there was a lot of outages mm -hmm. or something right. Yeah. Some there's some always some kind of catalyst and brand is ultimately the thing that makes them think about you and like you said just you know, subconscious product consideration. Yeah. So, um, and I'm and back to the final thing. I'm just happy that my leaders get it and that yep. I don't have to, I don't have to beg as to why I have to do things. Yeah. Have you been at a company where the leaders don't get it? And yeah. okay. So, so have I, several of them. And so a lot of people ask me, um, and I'm really interested before I say mine, I'm really, oh, I'm really interested in your response. And so, um, like people, people would comment and say like, how do I convince my leaders to, you know, um, to think about things this way? And like, what would you say to that? Where do I start, man? All right, so um, I won't say the company that I worked at, but I, you know, I used to run all of the SEO for a pretty well-known software company. And uh, my boss was like, you know, the blog doesn't seem to be generating leads. <laughs> like, really? You don't say. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I don't think it's working. I think we should stop doing blog. Mm -hmm. Like, really? Okay. So um, <clears throat> what do you think is going to happen when all the other companies that we're competing with, like, triple down on, like, their blog and, like, educating um, about the problems that may arise in their business? And what do you think is going to happen when uh, shoppers find them first? And he's like, hmm, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. But we still need leads from the blog. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, when was the last time you read a blog post and bought something? He was like, hmm, you're right, never. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, never. So basically that opened up a conversation to let's tie different ways of measuring uh, the blog value. Mm -hmm. Um, so we started optimizing for email list growth instead. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the conversation ultimately ended up with, okay, we agree that it's not a good idea to measure the blog based on conversion, mm -hmm. like actual form completions. Cause people are just in the education yeah. stage, you know, they're just, they're reading about problems that they may have. That's why it's valuable to do things like, um, you know, sales pipeline templates. If you're, you know, selling to salespeople. Um, you know, or sales forecasting templates, right? They want to be able to forecast shit without a software uh, at the beginning, and mm -hmm. then you give them tools and ways, and then they'll to search make it that. better. Yeah, and then you know you, they'll search that in Google. They'll download a template. They'll cough up their email address. Then you market to them through email nurtures mm -hmm. and stuff. And then eventually, back to the subconscious product thing. You know, they'll hopefully buy from you because mm -hmm. you've given them the tools that they need. So, yeah. So long story short, I have worked for companies like this. And I've done really good with reasoning with them around why it's a bad idea to just, you know, judge brand based on leads and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So. And I think um, I just I agree with everything you said. And there's just like a, another level that I wanted to add to it, which is um, there's, there's two things. If you can't get the message across and you believe in it a lot, maybe it's time to find somewhere else to work. And I think like that's a conversation that not enough people have with themselves. If you're serious about marketing, and you work at a company that doesn't understand marketing, you will have your career stunted, undoubtedly at some point. Yeah. Um, and another thing for marketers looking for a job, which I've made the mistake of, is finding a company that really believes is, is borderline marketing driven. I agree. Right? Like, agree. it's not that fun to be the, the one of three marketers in a sales driven company with 100, market, it 100 sucks. salespeople. It sucks. And so, because you just can't, you can't get done what you could do, and then, it, you get stuck in certain things. Yeah. Um, and going back to like the leadership, not believing in some things, I, I think there's a really interesting example on this because I work with companies and I, my, I have a strong belief in long form video that then get broken up. Obviously that's a, a very um, common strategy in companies. Um, you have to do it well for it to actually cut through and work and you need to know how to distribute it. Um, but it doesn't happen overnight. No. And so when, 
if I was working inside of a company running the LinkedIn strategy that I had, then I wouldn't have made it to here because my project would have gotten shut down yeah. six months ago. Yeah. And so just back to, to the blog thing, like, like that is really, it's really interesting to me how, much, how fast people will pull the plug without, when they don't actually understand what is going to happen or right. what it takes for that stuff to happen. Everyone right. wants things so fast. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really interesting. It has, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, by the way, I totally agree with everything you said. Uh, the um, <clears throat> if you're at a place that just you know doesn't get behind marketing, it may be time to leave. And interestingly enough, that's that did happen for me. I left mm -hmm. the company where I had the manager who didn't believe in the blog. Mm -hmm. Like while we did agree on on one way to kind of resolve that. It, it always ended up coming back to leads at some point. Mm -hmm. Like he'd agree f with it for three months and then he'd be like, I need leads from the block. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they just wouldn't let go on that one point. So, um, and, it, and it did, to your other point, happen to be a product driven, engineering driven, and sales driven. Um, that's what most of them are. That's what most of them are. You know, founders were very product centric, you know, so marketing tended to be an afterthought. But um, yeah, I left. Yeah. I, I did leave. I've and, done that and, before. Yeah. And I left actually right before like a large amount of stock was about to vest. And that just goes to show you how much I didn't care. Like mm -hmm. I'm like, it's not worth staying here for another, you know, X amount of months mm -hmm. just to get that because I'm in so much mental anguish yeah. over, over this situation mm -hmm. that like I just need to go somewhere that's going to support my ideas, mm -hmm. you know, want to want to collaborate with me on this uh, and give me, you know, uh, encouragement. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm really thankful that I'm, I'm somewhere now where, you know, our CEO loves marketing. He's a marketing driven CEO and he just gets, he just gets it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a rare treat and it's awesome to yeah. be able to just like brainstorm with him on marketing. Well. Yeah. So, um, obviously you're crushing it on LinkedIn. So what are, um, what are a couple like parts of the secret sauce? Like, let's give away some stuff. Let's give away some value to people. And I, I, I always feel super comfortable sharing the stuff. Yeah. The reason is that uh, there's basically two reasons. One is that 98% of people that watch this video and hear your advice aren't going to take it anyway. They won't do it. And yeah. the 1% that tries it is going to give up right away. And 1% that would have taken it would have had success anyway. So it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Um, and the second thing is that the strategy is such a small component of whether or not it works. Yes. It comes consistency, execution. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of, my strategy is not, not all that different than yours. Um, it's consistency, blocking and tackling. I think you said it last night at the event with, with Josh, but you know, you've committed to this, you know, you've made it part of your routine. Mm -hmm. You've made it part of your habit. It's a, it's a habit that you've built to post, you know, three times a week or whatever it may be. Um, and, and mine is the same. And, and I think we also have in common, you know, we don't talk about our products. We don't talk about our services. Uh, we don't talk, we don't boast, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's those kind of fundamental principles that I think guide a lot of it. Um, but I will maybe lift up the hood and share, yeah. some, share some tricks. Uh, so one is if your first line, the very first line, there, there's, there's two tricks with this. Uh, one is if the very first line states a problem, says this is the biggest problem with this. Mm -hmm. People love problems. Yeah. If I, I study Trump, politics aside, he's a <laughs> really brilliant marketer. And one thing he always does is he says problem. Mm -hmm. He says the word problem, this is a problem, it's a very big problem, it's a, and, and people are like, ooh, yeah, that is a problem. Mm -hmm. Wow, so you just, you're framing this, you're starting right away, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's something psychological yeah. about like, oh, I wanna read this. I wanna read this, yeah, like what is the problem? Like they wanna know what is the problem and then how do you solve the problem, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, and this is just funny, cause like I read a lot about psychology and like it just works. And especially when you see Trump doing it, it's genius. Mm -hmm. So if you say this is a problem, and then the very next line is, this is how you solve it. And then you explain why you solve it. And then beyond that, you go, um, this is the impact. Mm -hmm. Ba, 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 ba. Mm -hmm. So uh, like the, the post I had about um, uh, how to handle 
uh, when people ask you, how can I pick, can I pick your brain? Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, said, I saw that you one. Saw that, that one went, that was my, one of my most viral of all time, like 200,000 views mm -hmm. in like two weeks. Yeah. Nuts. So it did have that formula where problem, this is the problem. Too many people ask me for how do I pick my brain? Mm -hmm. The solution is, you know, you say, I'm happy to help you with that. Just actually shoot me your questions and I'll make a video about it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be able to repurpose that video. And then I, and then I outline the reasons why that works. Because, you know, uh, you're creating a content library for yourself. You're amplifying it across, you know, multiple channels and repurposing it for YouTube and LinkedIn and Twitter and, what, and you know, stories for Facebook, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, you have an excuse to create free content. You get to be perceived as an expert in the field. Um, and other people will see this thread and comment on it. So you'll get additional insight from the comment uh, thread, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't have gotten if it was just a typical, hey, I'll pick your brain. I know. It's so interesting yeah. because I commented on that post. We disagreed on this one. Oh, we did. Uh, yeah, yeah, we yeah, disagreed we did. on this yeah, one. Because I was like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, an, if I, if the person seems like the person that's actually going to get value from it, there's some people that ask me questions yeah. of like, even if I told you the answer, you're not going to use it. Yeah. And there's other people that would genuinely get value out of what I'm saying. I'll have the call, I'll film the call, my side of the call, and then I'll create get the content that way. It just allows me to go a little bit deeper. I think it's basically the it's same basically thing. The same it's thing. basically yeah, the same yeah. thing. It's, it's also basically like your event strategy as well. Like your event strategy is like, yeah, let's film these events, let's film these discussions, mm -hmm. and you know, it's content repurposing for days. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll have, you know, I'll be able to get a lot of mileage out of it. So yep. yeah, basically it was the same thing, just I guess kind of spun differently. But um, yeah, so that's one thing to do. And then the other thing to do with the first line is uh, if you address a certain group of people from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So if you say, hey, demand gen marketers, this is blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Or hey, VPs of sales, this is for you. Or something like if you address like that, you're going to just get more mm -hmm. focus from those people on that post. And it's going to tend to go deep within that network of people. Mm -hmm. I heard one thing in the first piece. I, I like that. I've used it sometimes. Yeah. Not even like intent. I've seen other people do it. I was like, I'll yeah. give it a shot. Yeah. It works. Um, I heard one thing that, I, that I'm really passionate about, which is like actually engaging in the comments. Yeah. And so whether, um, whether you're a brand or a person and whether you're on organic or paid, Community management is so overlooked in companies. Totally. And so I, I, uh, I have an example. I won't. I want to call out the brand. I, I actually. I might. Um, where I posted that thing about community management a couple days ago. I believe in it so much. I get so many insights from comments. I build relationships. I learn so much. I did the exact same thing when I was running Demand Gen for a brand. Yeah. I found out all the objections people had. I built yeah. relationships. I got all the questions that we didn't know how to answer. I then used those questions. I answered them. I deployed them to our sales team. So much value happening in there. Yeah. And then I go, and the, the next day I'm on Facebook, I get an ad from Marketo. And so I'm just curious, there's 67 comments. And I open it up and not a single comment has been answered. Some of the comments have been sitting there for 27 weeks. So they've been running this you know, ad for brand awareness, yeah. just sitting there just on sitting and off. Yeah. Comments, gifts that say stupid. Um, <laughs> there was not a single good response, response yeah. in there. It was all negative or completely irrelevant. People like spam. And they weren't moderating, mm -hmm. responding, and it also shows that they don't know how to target. Right. Like right. everything around that execution is wrong and you wonder why companies think the B2B Facebook doesn't work. Yeah. It's because yeah. it's the throwaway just, for them. Yeah, yeah. They forget about it, set and forget. Yeah. And then they, you know, they'll look at it once it's over. And it's like, it, it's so funny because people treat social differently, but the equivalent of what that is, is letting your billboard stay up for six months after someone just wrote graffiti all over it with yeah. curse words. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. And it's just like, um, yeah. Like, how can you allow that to yeah. happen? And you're supposed to be the leader in digital marketing and you can't make like a basic execution. I don't uh, know. Yeah, it's, it's shameful. Yeah. I'm, but you know, I guess no company I am, is perfect. Yeah, no, I totally, yeah. There, yeah. people could come and find, pick holes in everything that it's, I do. Totally. Right, like totally. It, it's actually not a knock on, on yeah. them at all. And yeah. I think I positioned that way, so let's just kind yeah. of backstep. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a really prime example because every brand does that. Yeah, and every brand has the potential to fall asleep at the wheel, no matter you know what it is. Whether you're just letting an ad run on autopilot and you mess up, or you know, one thing I did really poorly once at Sales Hacker was I tested a really kind of 
aggressive subject line in an email yeah. and I took a lot of thrash for it, mm -hmm. you know? And it was a big, and I'll tell you what it was. Big list. It was not your grandma's email newsletter. Mm -hmm. And people were like, what's wrong with my grandma? <laughs> like, like I, I took a lot of heat for it. I'm like, I didn't, ex like, I thought it was just like a, you know, catchy way to yeah. you know, get some attention. And yeah. like, uh, never again will I use grandma in a subject mm -hmm. line. Like, it won't work. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it happens, man. And then, uh, so, I've kind of given away all, like, at least I try to give away all the LinkedIn secrets. Um, I talked to, about one last night, and I think I want to kind of dive in a little bit more. And so, like, at the basics, in, on a LinkedIn strategy, you need yeah. to have good content, but the one that everyone misses is you need people to see it. Actually, in general, and I think this, uh, I actually want to hit this first, is that this is what happens at companies. $50 million SaaS companies mm -hmm. writing case studies, posting them organic on LinkedIn, getting six likes who are their employees, yeah. posting them on Facebook, getting likes from the family members of the employees, and nobody's seen it. And yeah. so what is the point of creating the content if you don't know how to distribute it? I talk about this a lot. Um, it's, it's really just, how, how should people do that? Like, you obviously know the strategy. Um, so let's say, you know, blah, 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 SaaS company has this case study. Like, how do they get it, how do they get it to people? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so there's, there's, I think the, the, uh, my mind is just racing. Yeah. Like, I want to say so many things. I'm trying to like, <laughs> oh man, this is such a good one. Like I want to just like say it in a methodical way. Um, so let's first let's just talk purely about LinkedIn organic. How okay. do you get reach on that? Um, if let's just say you were starting off tomorrow and you had like no traction, like you maybe have a couple thousand connections, you don't post a lot. What you're, what you're gonna have to do is just start somewhere and you're gonna have to realize that it's gonna be a slow start. But for every engagement that you do get, you do have to like, you know, really go in on that hard. So you have to respond to every comment, use hashtags and realize that this is gonna be a slow process. But eventually what happens is, once you get to like the levels that we're at on it, um, the, the, the way the algorithm works is that second degree connections will end up seeing it, liking it, commenting on it. That will amplify even further. And it's all about the content, right? So if you do have engaging content, there are ways to like kind of, you know, uh, hack the system, if you mm -hmm. will. You can like do uh, question-based threads. Like, you mm -hmm. know, one thing I, I, I'm going to post soon, I know it's going to erupt because I posted something about this a while ago. <laughs> it, was, it was like, do other, hey marketers, do you feel that email is a decaying channel? I want to talk about that, by the way. We, we should. We will go talk ahead. About finish that. your but thought. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm gonna post that, and like, I'm gonna post a little bit of my experience, why I think it's the king, and then I'm gonna say agree, yes or no. And I know that's gonna, you know, spark a wildfire, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you could do that as well. You could start debates and and you know, yes or no, mm -hmm. you know, kinds of threads to just like spark things going. Yep. So then eventually, when you post something about the brand, which I did recently, which was. Um, you know, we got recognized by Glassdoor as one of the top 100 best company cultures. That post got a lot of engagement. Now we take the, the link to that LinkedIn post and we share that with uh, candidates, actually. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't just send them the, the Glassdoor one. Mm -hmm. We send them people about our, like people in the company that are posting this to, to, as like validation, mm -hmm. as like, look, this is a big deal. Yeah. So that's one way that we uh, distribute like the mm -hmm. organic LinkedIn content. But maybe we should step out and talk about like content distribution in general. Yeah, with the case study. The case study, right? <clears throat> okay, so um, it's not easy. It's not easy to do. Like you know, pre and post those days are gone. I think you said you know the the LinkedIn strategy mm -hmm. or the Facebook strategy where you just post a case study and nobody sees it. Um, that's that's gone. Mm -hmm. So a uh, couple ways we do it. We work it into our our nurtures. So, for example, like um, we have uh, people that come into our funnel, they eventually get qualified as uh, or categorized as not ready to purchase. Mm -hmm. You know, there will be case studies that get worked into those nurtures. Now, I will admit that the engagement on those isn't as high as you would want because it's just I think people can feel that they're in a yeah. nurture. For sure. They feel like I'm in a system. Especially I'm in, if you're selling to a salesperson or a marketer. Yeah. They know. They, I, I feel like I'm in some kind of funnel that yeah. some marketer designed and I, I don't know I just don't like it mm -hmm. like I don't want to be in it 
Um, so uh, the other ways that we promote case studies is just having them on our highest traffic pages, mm -hmm. you know, with certain kinds of intent. Mm -hmm. So somebody like somebody searching, for example, for like, you know, um, cloud phone system features. Mm -hmm. um, we will have uh, basically <clears throat> testimonial videos and case studies embedded into those pages that rank highly uh, for us. I like it. So that, you know, it gives them a little taste. Mm -hmm. So it may just be a brushing. It may just, they just may click that video, watch, you know, the first 30 seconds. Okay, I get it. But like, that's the way we kind of, we view it as mm -hmm. like, let's uh, put these assets in places where people are looking mm -hmm. instead of outbound uh, where, hey, uh, you know, in, like a cold DM. Uh, I'm reaching out to a manufacturing company. Hey, here's a manufacturing case study where we did XYZ. They're not ready for that. They're, they're not ready for that, yeah. yeah. So um, I, my take on it when it comes to content distribution is like find places where there's already a lot of traffic going and put those assets in places where you know there's likely to you know, be a match and be valued. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have one and it'll, it'll pull a lot of the things that we've already talked about together, which is that if you don't think about paid advertising as direct response needed an ROI, then you are comfortable spending $5,000 to amplify a case study targeted at the people that you're selling to. Yeah. And we, it's one of our best executions. Yeah. So take a case study, draft it up. You know that they're going to be on mobile. So the case study has to be digestible quickly. So three minutes maximum, keep it short, high level points focused on business outcomes. Yeah. Deliver it on mobile, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn's tough for the awareness because the CPMs are too high, but yeah. Facebook and Instagram for sure. Yeah. And then deliver the case study. You can get like 4% click through. So we're right now we're running one, 37 cents a landing page view targeted at the people. Cons and then you look at time on page, consuming the entire case study because wow. I read it and I know how long it took to read. Consuming the entire case study mm. and then you just wait. Because what's going to happen, and this is, we're getting really deep into what we do, is that we don't ask for the conversion on the mobile device. I know that if you're on a mobile device, you're way less likely to convert because you're on a train or you're at blah, 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 or yeah. you're busy. Yeah. You didn't expect to get this in your feed. And so we don't ask for any type of conversion. If you read the thing, that was worth the 37 cents I just paid. Mm -hmm. And then we wait because that person's probably actually not the decision maker. There might be an influencer and they're going to go to the office in three days and they're going to say, hey, did you see that case study about this? And then Jimmy, their coworkers, be like, yeah, I saw that too. It looked pretty cool. And they're going to tell their boss, Jamie, and Jamie's going to go onto the website and she's going to convert. Wow. Yes. Yeah. It is a killer execution. Yeah. You can do the same thing with short form blogs, case studies, anything that's like mid top. It can't yeah. be, it, yeah. as you go farther down, it's, it's going to get way yeah. less effective. Yeah. And so if it's, if it's positioned as, um, I like somehow being in a news feed and positioning your content as news. Yeah. yeah. And so like it, yeah, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah. But the difference between how to do this versus, you know, blah, blah, blah brand yeah. got, gained 500K in revenue through this thing. Through this thing. And it yeah. looks like an article. Yeah. And so it feels educational. Yeah. It feels like something they can get and they digest quickly. It is awesome. I've seen, I've seen that tactic. It's actually very effective. Mm -hmm. um, surprisingly, I've also seen that tactic on Twitter. Interesting. And, and yeah, we don't touch Twitter. Yeah, I don't touch it either, but I've seen other brands do it and it, and it works. I've mm -hmm. seen it on Facebook and Twitter and it works. Mm -hmm. I, want, I did want to ask you about LinkedIn ads. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I'll, I'll admit, I haven't cracked it yet. We're in the same camp, my friend. <laughs> okay. We've run a lot. So we run, yeah. um, we run a lot of the ads we run are top, of the, top mid funnel okay. content with no direct response action. Okay. And so in that case, like getting them to click and consume the content is the is the objective. Mm -hmm. On Facebook, when you're paying six dollars CPMs and you're getting four percent click throughs, the cost makes sense. Yeah. When you're paying six dollars per view on a piece of content on LinkedIn, it doesn't make as much sense as when you're paying thirty seven cents, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you, ha I think you have to change the strategy. Yeah. Um, I have a hunch that if you had really, uh, I know people that are quote unquote getting it to work with mid funnel okay. Okay. to to like nurture or some type of thing, but the sales cycle lengths are They're longer than out, longer than outbound. Yeah. You're yeah. basically getting their email and then somehow they buy it later. Yeah. Um, and so maybe there's something there, but yeah, I haven't yeah. I haven't figured it out yet. The CPMs are too high. They're too high. Yeah, same here. So you if know. you're not selling, I mean, for yeah. you especially, like, you, what's the ACV average? Uh, it's low. Yeah. It, it's and low. so yeah. like. I think, I mean, even if you're selling 100K ACV products, yeah, I think it's still, yeah. I think it's still challenging. Yeah. Like if we, most of the companies we work with are eight to 25K ACVs yeah. and the math just doesn't work. Yeah. 
to, I mean, we're, yeah, we're in that, you know, 25 to 50 range. Yeah. And um, the other thing that, I, that I'm finding about LinkedIn ads, because we have tested a lot of things, is the more top of funnel you go, the actually the better your odds are. Mm -hmm. But it's like you said, the cost is just so tough to justify, mm -hmm. um, especially when you don't have huge ACVs mm -hmm. and you get people into the into the into your funnel, right? From from some super juicy top funnel thing like yep. the new new data on you know the state of business communications, where mm -hmm. you know we found that X amount of executives do this and whatever. Um, you get them in, and then you know how do you over time like you just say like this is going to be really hard yeah because it's a very top funnel thing we it was juicy enough to get their attention and get them to want to exchange their their email address for mm -hmm. the content but now it's like crap they it's so hard to just get them from stranger to interested mm -hmm. even I if mean, the audience targeting is good yeah yeah uh, in general I think one of the things people mess up is that social platforms are awareness channels, yeah. not intent channels. Not intent channels. And they yeah. treat them like intent, intent channels, channels, and that's yeah. why when yeah. you run the ads and you get the conversions, they don't close. Yeah. They close at they, incredibly so low, low rate. Yeah, low. So it's not even worth running the ads. Yeah. One thing that I was thinking off the top of my head, and we're gonna experiment with this, is I think the one place that could work for LinkedIn ads is using it to sign up for either a live event or a webinar is probably the best the the highest likelihood of working yeah um like running local ads in greater la come to this event for free yeah. with this person hey vps of sales in la yeah we're having this yeah. thing you know what i mean like <laughs> a lot of strategies yeah. we talked about yeah. like that might work um because at that point at that point it's probably worth the whatever you're going to pay 50 to 100 dollars per conversion yeah. for yeah. someone to do and get to that event yeah um that might make sense i think so I, uh, my thing with LinkedIn now though is like, why would I even run any ads? Exactly. I'm so good with organic. I can get probably 30 people to sign up for a webinar with one post. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think I exactly. need to spend money. And I think that's part of LinkedIn's like diabolical plot. And like, I think uh, their whole plot was if we create excitement organically with these algorithmic, you know, with this, all this algorithmic juice, Mm -hmm. So people are now feeling excited. Wow, I'm getting, you know, exposure and, yeah. and reach. They're going to be more likely to want to, you know, spend mm -hmm. with advertising to couple with that. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's working because I think I'm seeing more LinkedIn ads, but I just don't think that they're effective. Like me personally, I would never click on one yep. and I would never buy anything mm -hmm. from one. And I would never, if I do, <laughs> you know, I'll just tell you, if I do really want the content, I will use a fake email, one of those fake yeah, email yeah. address generators and yeah, because I just don't want to get spammed. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think um, <laughs> the two best LinkedIn ads I've seen and another thing that I want to mention is the LinkedIn ad product is just so far behind other ad products. Like if you go Facebook yeah. ads manager versus yeah. LinkedIn, no, whatever campaign day. manager, yeah. whatever they call it, yeah. it's just not even close. Yeah. Like the ability for different ad variations and objectives and blah, blah, blah. the targeting is the only good yeah. piece of the yeah. of the product. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, where were we going with that? The uh, uh, on LinkedIn uh, ads, bottom LinkedIn of the ads, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I forgot. Yeah, I, I guess I guess the moral <laughs> of the story is that they're just not as effective as we thought they would be. Yes. Yeah. There's a there, there's a lot of attention yeah. on the platform. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, I'm just not seeing the ads work. Yeah. And it's and I think. <clears throat> I know I, I've talked to a lot of people about what they're doing in marketing. A lot of people are testing it. I've never heard one person say that they've really figured it out. Yeah. Um, and even the people that are saying that are, are working I, by what they're measuring it on, I wouldn't deem it working. I, I would agree. There, yeah. I've n I haven't met anyone yet that says LinkedIn ads are working so good that we're taking budget out of AdWords yeah. and putting it to LinkedIn. Like, dude, you just don't hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think we're gonna get ready to wrap up, but what we do toward the end is flip it for one or two questions. So yeah. if you have a question or two you wanna ask me, and then we'll jam up on those and then we'll wrap up. Okay, um, so let's talk about uh, SEO. Okay. My, my favorite topic. Okay. Uh, what, are you, what are you just seeing? Like what are you observing with maybe clients or just in you know, your work, daily workflow in general? 
like is what are you seeing happening with SEO trends like problems like just mm -hmm. what are you seeing this is a really uh, really interesting question for okay. me so I do not touch SEO okay okay I do not touch it because what I'm doing and this uh, this is super debatable and I know that SEO works but it, yeah. it's just not not what I do yeah is that I do all of the heavy lifting on social or content and then create branded search. So okay. we're not. So that's that's the mechanism. And I think by by being able to accelerate it with paid rather than wait, yeah. not, then the dynamics are changing. Right? If Facebook paid goes away or becomes ineffective, then there's like some vulnerabilities in the strategy. But yeah. right now it's working. LinkedIn's starting to turn on. We're seeing results with YouTube. So right. we have enough of a mix that we're spread out. Um, but instead of waiting nine months for that blog post to index, yeah. I'm gonna write the I'm gonna write the blog post, run ads to it on everybody, and I'm gonna force yeah. them to see it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so well, that's maybe got maybe we'll talk about this. Like, how much easier is it to run an effective paid acquisition or paid you know branding uh, campaign or strategy when SEO is humming? For like, sure. Doesn't it just make things so much better? Like, For sure. It improves click through rate across the board. Mm -hmm. You have this. I hate. Dare do I use this word? Synergy uh, mm -hmm. effect where you know you can kind of like dominate the the search results in some yeah. ways. Let's uh, uh, let me let me kind of back step yeah. one. So yeah. top of funnel SEO. I. I our clients publish blogs. We might get SEO out of it, but we're not yeah. writing for SEO. We're writing for social. Okay. Mid like product based and tent based keywords. We'll fill with AdWords while we while we index. Okay. But we're like going for if we're selling a fire suppression system, we're trying to rank number one for that yeah. term, yeah. right? But we're not trying to rank for like what are the things that I should look for while I'm trying to yeah. you know fight the fires or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I just yeah. stay I, I stay out of that because yeah. I can I think I can get that work done more effectively elsewhere. Yeah, fair enough. Faster. Yeah. Fair um, so yeah. yeah, that's the uh, that's the approach to SEO. I mean, some people some people. Uh, hate that perspective. Some people see the the merit in it. It's whatever. I'll tell I'll tell you why. You know. Well, first of all, I'm good at it. It's yeah. it's, it's what I'm best at. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the other reason why I believe in it so much now more than ever before is because um, what I'm seeing from the competition is is that yeah they're going nuts on trade shows. Mm -hmm. They're going nuts on banners. But where they're not going nuts is long term long tail mm -hmm. question based problem solving SEO. Mm -hmm. And I know from my experience that um, the way that you build momentum with uh, marketing is also by long tail SEO because um, what ends up happening is you get these small wins that just add up and compound over time. So mm -hmm. you start getting very, very high intent traffic coming to the site for these obscure keywords, mm -hmm. right? Like we're talking less than 10 searches a month. Yeah. How many phone lines do I need for my business? Mm -hmm. That sounds like someone that needs to buy soon. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be found for that, even yeah. though it has ten searches. So you know, you do a couple hundred of those. Mm -hmm. Now, and they're not hard to rank for because difficulty is low. Competitors are ignoring mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. uh, then you couple that with retargeting and paid acquisition, and mm -hmm. now you're, wow, it's a thing. Yeah. Of, you're, in, you, it's a thing of beauty. Super so, interesting. So, yeah, that, that I guess that was just one. But maybe the other one is, uh, what are you seeing in like the world of like retargeting? Uh, what are some of the trends and, and things that you're okay. seeing there? Two, two questions, the places that I rarely touch actually. Yeah. Um, so if we look at the camp of performance marketing versus brand marketing, I'm 80%, yeah. I'm 80 brand and the intent based stuff I'm doing mostly on AdWords. Yeah. Maybe, maybe AdWords to, to pre-roll YouTube, which I think is an awesome That's execution nice right one. now. Yeah. So like somebody's typing in growth marketing consulting firm, yeah. $80 word on AdWords, four cent view yeah. on YouTube. Um, I'm gonna put the, the case study of my customer who yeah. had a lot of success on that place and I'll run a bunch of views there. So um, those are the places where we'll run quote unquote like intent based. Okay. Um, and then retargeting, we've run to build audiences on on Facebook or, or LinkedIn or something and run yeah. retargeting. But to be honest, like if you have a well-defined audience, I just find it's easier to just run to the entire audience job title yeah. targeted. Yeah. Well, you just sparked an idea for me, like, like really a question. So that's the one of the biggest things we actually struggle with is we don't have a very clearly defined buyer. Mm -hmm. You know, we rank in search engine for the keyword, number one for the keyword business phone service. Mm -hmm. You can imagine the wide array 
of audience types, shoppers that are searching for that. Anything, you know, it could be your software companies, it could be, you know, Joe's flower shop yeah, down the street. I was just gonna say that. You know, right? So it's a lot of that. So what do you do like from an advertising like standpoint when you don't have a very clearly defined like, you know, ICP? It mm-hmm. could be this, this wide, vast array of buyers um, from all these different verticals. Like, how do you attack that from, mm-hmm. you know, even like a top and mid funnel, like, advertising yeah it's super interesting because the way that i the way that i solve it is through messaging on the the website okay interesting and so i think a lot of SaaS companies when they um when they have their website it's very product and outcome focused not necessarily specific to any icp naturally they're selling a utility to a a bunch of different industries yeah but i will say that the um the SaaS company that sells a tool that goes to real estate agents and whatever like six Mm -hmm. other verticals Mm -hmm. if you had the page and it was you know four real estate agents you're not going to get conversions from the other verticals verticals, right and so it's tough if you sell to a bunch um but i think that there's a way through messaging because i I work in i've worked with clients that have a very well we're selling to emergency medicine physicians okay like that's and so that's like that and the messaging shows up and if yeah. you are you know a real estate agent you're not going to convert on that even though like if the, the product might actually be what you need because yeah. the messaging filters you out yeah. our like conversion rate from lead to sale like literally bottom of the funnel form conversion to revenue was 40 percent on that type of stuff yeah. it's so it's targeted, so targeted. Yeah. but then you go to SaaS clients and i expect that exact same thing when we're looking at the data and we're seeing like somewhere between 10 and 15% right. conversion rates. Right. And the difference is because I believe it's because of the messaging not filtering out the buyers that are that don't fit. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, we have uh, verticalized campaigns mm-hmm. like in AdWords and stuff, but we do struggle with this and like with the core messaging. It's like, who is this for? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, we're for business owners, you know, that are growing fast. And yet yeah, we also have big clients as well. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the other thing we're trying mm-hmm. to crack too. It's like, you know, do we go with the big logos on our homepage to show that we're working with clients like the Buffalo Bills and Netflix and Conan O'Brien? Mm-hmm. Um, does that turn off the does that Joe's turn Flower off, Shop? Do, right. Does that turn off Joe's Flower Shop? Mm-hmm. Oh, they're too big. Mm-hmm. But then on the flip side, if we just go with kind of middle of the road brands that aren't the most impressive and don't have the most amount of cachet, yeah, uh, do big companies see that and say, mm, they're too small? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's chicken it's, or the egg. Yeah I, yeah, I actually don't know if there's a, yeah. a like a real solution to that. Yeah. Um, but that's what I, I see the same thing. Yeah. There was one topic, and I, I just have to get it in, um, and we could go on for a while, and it's get, getting warm in here, <laughs> and so we'll just like try and figure it out, but. Um, so ABM, Ooh. <laughs> I know, I know. So I'm um, like, I've, I've shared my thoughts on this, but never in like a really cohesive fashion, but I'll frame it up and then we'll kind of like at least dive in. Okay. So I think that we'll set it up is, is it the real deal or is it hot air? And I think the next step is to actually define what ABM is because um, right now we have vendors pushing ABM, which is basically like pick accounts. We'll measure if their IP addresses come to your website and then just spam them with SDR touches, banner ads, banner ads. direct mail yeah. and all this other, like that's basically, maybe we'll get LinkedIn sponsored content, which we just talked about. It doesn't, yeah. it isn't working. Yeah. So basically yeah. they take three or four ineffective marketing executions, package <laughs> it into the product. And that forces you to use those mediums when there's better things to do. Yeah. And so. Um, if you take it based on what the vendor is saying, then I would say that it's a waste of money. Yeah. I would say that it's ineffective. Yeah. The, yeah. the methodology of picking accounts and focusing with them and doing those things is a wonderful methodology. Yeah. I just think the text behind. Um, and on the flip side, I see that most of what companies do, let's say account-based marketing, yeah. is account-based performance marketing. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yes. Um, so meeting, and with with marketers now just being scored on meetings, basically, yeah. basically yeah. right? Basically. Basically, yes. and so like, I think it, it brings companies into a place where 
they don't even really have a marketing department anymore. Yeah, I really do yeah, think that yeah. when you're so performance marketing focused, it's, it's, it's becoming yeah. it's becoming sales. Yeah, it's becoming sales. Um, yeah. And so I think at a macro, it's creating um, bad marketing behavior in the industry. Yeah. And in the micro, the tools that the vendors are selling are actually not the most effective way to do marketing in general. Yeah. Um, what can I say? <laughs> you know, I, I, what can I say, man? I agree with everything you just outlined. Yeah. Conceptually, you know, the idea from going one to many to one to one is great. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I use the analogy of a, of a fisherman, you know, casting that net and just trying to gobble up a bunch of shrimp. You're no longer trying to do that. You're spear fishing for the whale. Mm -hmm. uh, that I totally get. And I think it's great. But also, like you said, you know, it is kind of creating this bad behavior because it's just too performance oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, think about it. We have a marketer working with like four salespeople, you know, plotting on how to, you know, crack this account or mm -hmm. crack this company. OK, you're mapping out the key stakeholders, you know. This person's demand generation, they're probably a decision maker, a marketing ops, they're probably the, you know, unlocking the key to the finance, mm -hmm. um, you know, mapping out who needs to be involved in the decision. Th then, you know, and how much time do you spend on, on one account mm -hmm. and then another account? And then like, how, like, mm -hmm. how do you just manage it all? And I know there's expensive tools mm -hmm. that are requ uh, supposedly required that I personally have not trialed yet. Mm -hmm. But I know that there's tools like, you know, Engageo, Triblio, demand base, mm -hmm. you, you know, they're, they're complicated stacks mm -hmm. that have to, you know, basically be working together. And then there's intent data. So that's why I get spammed for people trying to sell me intent data because they just automatically assume that demand gen is doing nothing but ABM. Mm -hmm. But yet they like, actually, it's the opposite. Like, I'm not doing that much ABM. I'm doing very little, actually. Mm -hmm. There may be one or two target accounts per quarter that like we're at, we're interested in in going mm -hmm. after, and then we'll build appropriate content around that. But for the most part, I'm still running a huge inbound machine. Mm -hmm. People forget like conversion rate optimization, SEO, AdWords, paid acquisition. Like the fundamentals of marketing are like not stopping. Mm -hmm. So don't just think that you know marketers aren't marketing anymore. We're just doing ABM, which mm -hmm. is sales. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, man, I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I, I direct mail is something you mentioned. I, yeah. I think that can be effective. I've heard stories from fellow marketers of mine at big companies that say direct mail is huge. Mm -hmm. I haven't cracked it yet. I don't know mm -hmm. if you have, but no. I haven't, I haven't cracked it. No. I haven't, I haven't tried, I haven't tried it. it. I haven't, yeah, I haven't tried it. Enough. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you just, um, there's a, there's a careful balance, um, between, going really strong in what's already working. Yeah. Like in 2016, Facebook, people were like, yeah. you should run ABM, you should do, I wasn't even running Google ads because Facebook was working so good and I had a limited budget. Like why, if I know if I put a dollar in and I get a hundred in pipeline and I'm closing 33% of that, why would I ever take dollars out of that and put it into Google AdWords? Exactly. I have a $10,000 budget right now. I'm going all in with this. Yeah. And so I think there's a balance between knowing that something is working and having the intuition to recognize when you should try something new. Because there's no, unless you have a huge company, there's no way to be testing and checking the stuff. But I, I often will like kind of fact check my beliefs. And so like, for instance, recently, like I don't believe in sending conversion based emails and b2b like hey, come get a demo yeah like i just i don't believe I, in that either. I, I don't believe in it yeah. um but last week for for a client like we wanted to to check whether or not that would work and so we sent it we sent a seventy thousand list we sent it to um decent click through two demos not the juice was not worth the yeah. squeeze what what were the opt-outs i don't know the number I, I would quote if i if i did i would say it um I right. just, but it's a, it's a yeah. really valid question because I yeah. bet they, they were higher and I bet the two, I mean, we'll see what happens with the demos, yeah. but you're selling a product that's yeah. 10K ACV. Yeah. You lost a thousand subscribers, hypothetically, yeah. who knows what it actually is. Yeah. That's a made up number, but like, is it worth it? The same thing goes for LinkedIn direct message selling. Mm. Wouldn't you think it's Big quote unquote one. opt out? Um, because yeah. what people, uh, people are confused when they, send messages to a thousand or a thousand people in sales nav over a 10 day period or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And they get one demo. Yeah. 
um, but, but they've they just got 150 people removing connections yeah, or, or blocking blo or, blocking yeah. or, or reporting whatever. you for spam. Or just like knowing where you came from yeah. and seeing your headline, blah, you know, sales executive at blah, 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 and just making a mental note about whether that impact was negative or positive, and it was negative. Yeah. And now it suddenly all, that entire brand is, is negatively associated because of that interaction. So there, yeah. there's several companies that have done that to me, big companies. Yeah. Like mo most, I mean, there's the people that are guilty of it are really small companies or really big companies, often not really in the middle. Big company, um, I was a previous user of their software at two companies. I brought it into two companies. Um, and now, you know, we work with a bunch of clients. And if it was, yeah. you know, a product, I would recommend it to a lot. And they've done it to me three times with three different <laughs> reps. And oh, I, I won't buy their software at all. It's half product. Yeah. It's half product reason, but it's half how you also like go to market. I it's agree. really interesting. I mean, maybe that's my, the marketer in me speaking, but if yeah. you're selling to marketers and you're going to market in that way, yeah. like there's, there's an impact there. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess on a final note, I just kind of look at one thing aside from like, you know, if you send an email to 70,000 and there is pipeline associated with that, fine. The one thing I always look at is what is the uh, opt out to cl click ratio. Mm -hmm. So if your opt outs are higher than your clicks, regardless that's, of that's really bad. That's really bad. That's really bad. Or even it's or borderline even like, spam. Yeah, it's borderline spam. Even if it's the same, if you had just as many opt outs as you had clicks, it's an unsuccessful email, mm -hmm. regardless of if you had one person biting on that mm -hmm. because you just sprayed and prayed to the masses, mm -hmm. you got lucky, congratulations, yeah. but the damage that you've done is greater mm -hmm. than that little bit of nugget, that one little chicken nugget you got mm -hmm. out of that bag. The rest of the bag broke open and the fries and the nuggets went all over the floor. And you you know that only 5% of the people that didn't like the email actually opted out. So right. you've left a negative left impression a negative on impression a huge amount huge, right. that you actually haven't measured. Right, and the next yeah. time you send something, they probably will opt out. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that people undervalue email, Yeah. and we see really good success with email to deliver content, specifically yeah. long-form video content packaged in emails works really well. Yeah, I think it goes back to the, I, I agree with that, and I think it goes back to the LinkedIn strategy, you know, like, Signal to noise ratio applies for almost any execution you want to do in marketing, whether it's email. You have to provide a lot of value before you send that offer. Um, your blog, it can't just be product update, product update, um, ads. It can't be, you know, to get a demo, get a demo, get a demo, it creates this numbing effect. If, I think the bottom line, uh, what I'm getting from this conversation that's really just making me just poof, is if you maintain signal to noise ratio in every channel for every execution, you will be successful. Yeah. What's in there? <laughs> Hell <it>. yeah. <laughs> Good shit, man. <laughs>